life. <laughs> wonderful. Well, we're having a wonderful free conversation here, but we want to Indeed. welcome everyone to GW4W's Wine and Tea Wednesdays. We hope each of you have a beverage and can relax a little bit with us. And with that, I'm going to pass the conversation over to Chris Andrews, GW4W's London Lead and the CEO of Personal Touch Fitness. Great to see you, Chris. Great to see everyone and great to see you men. Thank you very much. My co-host today is Deanne Johnson. She is the womanologist and she's the master coach to women in leadership and a GW4W member. So thank you for co-hosting with me today, Deanne. And for our guest today, we have Sharon Amzu. Welcome. We are going to be talking about, about the courageous leadership in women. She's an award-winning speaker on leadership. So I'm, we're all looking forward to you sharing um, insights with us about leadership. So I will start out and I will say, what's your definition of courage and why have you chosen it as a pivotal theme in your service to Leander? Uh, so I think when I think about leadership, I think about uh, Aristotle and mm. as a speaker, so my background is law actually, and my uh, one of the things that I've been drawn to is language. Clearly, as a lawyer, lexicon, how we use language is really important. And I've uh, been struck by uh, one of the key influencers in, in the space of public speaking, who is um, Greek philosopher Aristotle. And from his deduction of looking at the highest of human qualities, he landed on courage. And I always wondered, why is it that of all of the characteristics that one could land on in terms of quality of character, why did he land on courage? Mm -hmm. And for example, why not integrity? And I see that it, courage is the one thing that enables you to take action in the face of fear. Mm -hmm. So where you may be intimidated, mm -hmm. overwhelmed, where you may be facing obstacle and hurdle, it's the ability to notwithstanding that, take action. And I believe that every successful leader is able to do that. In the mm -hmm. face of opposition, they are still able to move forward against the odds, mm -hmm. even when there's no guarantee of success, mm -hmm. notwithstanding that, the ability to do the right thing. And so for example, if we take that in contrast with integrity then, it may well be, and of course one would argue that a, a, a pillar to good leadership, to conscientious leadership, is integrity. We want to have leaders who are honest, who are transparent, who we can trust their word, integrity. But in order for, an, for a leader to have integrity, they must have courage, because it takes courage to live out your values. It takes courage to be true to yourself and to trust your judgment. And so that's why I hone in on courage, because what I know for sure is those leaders who make an impact, who, who leave a positive legacy, they are able to be courageous. Oh, that's so powerful. Mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I didn't know it was Aristotle that talked about that, but you know, yes. there's so, so much to what you say. Right now, the consensus is that everything has changed forever. So there is, there's a lot of opposition. There's a lot of, there's a lot of tension. There's a lot of newness. There's a lot of uncertainty. So what have you noticed going on right now in view of the change that we've seen with the pandemic? What are leaders facing? What are the challenges? What are the new demands and requirements that our leaders are needing courage for right now? Yeah. So I, I see this period, oftentimes we hear the expression unprecedented. And there could all, almost be, uh, it could almost be seen as a hackneyed overused term. Actually, it, it's not. Um, and across any index, you yeah. will see that we are indeed in unprecedented times. And when I think about that then, I associate that with the leader being the cartographer, the cartographer who shapes oh, and forges and maps. Analogy. 
Yeah. And if we if we look back at when maps were, were being written and being forged and, and curated, then oftentimes in those unknown areas, they would be described as uh, terra incognita, the land we don't know. Mm. And oftentimes they'd also be synonymous with here be dragons. If you don't know what's there, it's really scary. So you'd have it, uh, uh, terra incognita was also... Uh, uh, yes, the equivalent to that was uh, um, here be dragons it's scary out there we don't know and yet still there'd be a forging forward and so modern leaders right now in many ways are cartographers we're going into unknown territory we don't know what it's like to create an environment and to do strategic planning and to have scenario planning in, in situations where there is no predictability whatsoever. Yeah. So what does that mean, for example? Do we know if there's going to be a spike again or mm -hmm. not? No, we mm -hmm. don't. So you're having to curate and you're having to, to plan against a context where you don't know what will actually be happening. The, the, the certainty is, is completely gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's all, it's all in the air. What, how, how much planning do we need? We need to have a certain, ordinarily we need to have a certain level of security about, for example, if you're in the art sector and most of your uh, business requires people to be coming through the door, well, that's just not possible. And someone was likening it to the war, and, and, and I know there's no, it's not a moral equivalence, but um, I was listening to a veteran talk about the World War, World War I, World War II, and how that's different from now. And one of the things that they, they uh, differentiate between where we are and where, where they were was the fact that at least we could come together in the war. Right. At least we could open our shops during the war, all mm -hmm. right? And what you'd look out for is that alarm that said, actually, let's get the uh, button down the hatchet, hatches um, and let's go to ground. But once that those air raids had gone, we could re-emerge. We right. could then go into the shops, albeit that it was rationing and so on. We don't have that now. There was, we've never had before mm. this shutting down of all of those key elements that keep us connected, that we're able to build. All of those core elements are gone. And so it, it completely is unknown territory. Yeah. We've never been this and way that, before. And that ties so deeply. I mean, you know, we're a science-based organization and the one thing that we touch on every now and then is evolutionary biology and so that it, it's it's core to how we survived as a species yeah. and that there's actual that chemical reaction there's an actual physical chemical reaction that happens when people are close when you're able yeah. to hug someone when you're able to do that so it, it it ties into like i think of these leaders that um that I've talked to, some of them that are devastated about the number of people they've had to lay off and what they're internally going through yes. and then not necessarily having the support system behind them. So I think there's, there's the inner unknown for some of these leaders um, and how do, you, how do you take care of yourself and I think there's a part, you know, a part about that, that that is courageous about that, that mm -hmm. often we put ourselves last or we're out there for our teams or, or you know, or we think that we have to put up this persona uh, and not really being courageous enough to say, this is what I need to be the better leader. And I'm just yeah. curious, like, even just how, saying, I don't know, even, even, yeah, yeah. Just, even just being able to say, right. I don't know. I know as, just from working with other women leaders, how difficult it is for, for, for CEOs and directors and high level leaders to even just say, I don't know, I don't have right. all the answers, I don't see it all clearly. Like, do you find that, Sharon? And what are you Most struggling definitely. with? What's calling you to be more courageous right now, Sharon? Yeah, so, um, so most definitely to part one, I, I, I do see that. And I feel that um, it's particularly difficult for women because, mm -hmm notwithstanding the changes and the shifts that we're seeing in society in terms of recognizing the, the strength that a f female leadership brings into the space and, and honoring those and celebrating those and validating those, notwithstanding the tide that we're seeing turn, the, the structure is still very much in recognition of a male type of leadership, all right? And that 
uh, that in fact, when we think of leaders instinctively, we think of male leaders. And so for women in that space then, to be able to say, I don't know, it, you're already on the back foot in terms of perception in their own minds. And then to concede that you don't know how to, to navigate this terrain, almost reinforces their own and reinforces this perception that, well, perhaps you shouldn't be there in the first yeah. place. Right. And so there is already that hurdle to overcome mm. in terms of perception, let alone the actual reality that nobody right now knows the path to take and it's an iterative step-by-step -step move forward where we're going to have to very much be probing and sense making and mm -hmm. retrospectively co bringing retrospective coherence as we look back as things evolve it's literally that but it's 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 more difficult and i understand why it's more difficult for women to do that because we already have this perception about leadership being very much a male domain. Um, for, for myself, it, it's the same. It's the same as any other, other woman uh, in terms of the, the challenges when I, I'm a professional speaker speaking at conferences and so on. And so the entire uh, hospitality industry that was uh, struck out in one foul swoop in COVID. And so it's been very much for me about a whole um, reimagining of, of, um, of my work and how to bring what I would ordinarily do in person and engaging with my, with my clientele in the online space and, and really rethinking that and reshaping and being innovative and, and in the midst of the unknown. I'm not sure if I'm echoing or not. I don't I think, I not. think Dion, if you could do me a favor, I think Dan, if you just mute your mic when you're not speaking, that would be really helpful. Yeah, I'm hearing a little it's feedback better, too, so thank you. Better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's, literally, it's literally all of that. And of course, alongside that, it's, it's being resilient mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. enabling mm -hmm. and encouraging the leaders that I'm working with and leading to also be resilient. In, one, in the conversations that I'm having as, as chair, because I'm chair of the Greater Manchester branch of the Institute of Directors, and I'm working with hundreds of leaders across our city region who are being looked to by the people that they are leading for, for leadership, for direction, mm -hmm. for a path, for light, for hope. They're all of that. And they're having to navigate that as well remotely. So as you're saying, Mim, one of the, the hardest things is that social um, interaction that enables the building of relationship that enables us to be much more comforting and encouraging and, and empowering when we do that in person. And now we're having to do to do that. It's at a really sharp point, a piercing point mm -hmm. in our challenges, and we're not able to hold the hand or give the hug in person. So mm -hmm. all of that um, builds up, culminates in really challenging times for leaders, having to lay someone off virtually. Yeah. I mean, is it, oh. a, a, any good leader who, who has a heart will find that incredibly hard and they're having to do that and that inevitably takes its toll. Well, oh. and I was just going to say, with saying all that as well, is that everybody has their personal story and their personal grief that they're going through as well and they're carrying. Yes. So, you know, you talked er just earlier about that support, you know, network from everybody we are doing it virtually and it's very difficult so we have Absolutely. to really dig deep to support and be For sure that the For courageous sure, leader well and i think I, 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 sorry go ahead no that's okay but I, yeah just the the courage piece of this what i find fascinating i mean just watching here we are in this pandemic there are new rules that we have to follow if we're going to protect each other mm -hmm. you know we, it it brings up for me we had a conversation last week around there is no me without you mm -hmm. and what does that really mean for us and i think that we're struggling so much so how do you know so looking courage to role model what that looks in this next normal and what the next normal is going to look like is just this other layer that that's been put on leaders and i would think that that when you only have a set experience in your lifetime, that this is what I've learned and now you're being thrown into this, 
I think that my question around this is like the courage, like, like more of the masculine versus the feminine mm -hmm. from a leadership perspective, how does that serve us or not serve us from a courageous leadership perspective from your, pers you know, from what you've seen? Yeah. So I think at, at its core, courage is not gender specific. Mm -hmm. Courage is just the ability to act in the face of challenge, in the face of fear, that. And what, what I would do in terms of contextualizing it is, is bring to attention um, female leaders, where have we been courageous before? Mm -hmm. like what, one of the arenas where we have had to step into and find our courage. Is it the case that, um, is it more likely to be the case, for example, that I've had to dig deep and call on my courage than, for example, my white male counterparts? Well, I would say in certain respects that that is the case. I'll give you a for instance. Mm -hmm. So my, my whole journey toward the profession, my legal profession, meant that in so many ways I was on the back foot. So I didn't come, I came from a background that was, um, you know, a working class background. Um, I was uh, the first person in my family to go to university. Um, I entered a profession where the people in the room did not look like me, not simply did they not look like me in terms of um, gender for the most part, but also in terms of color but also in terms of socioeconomic background. And so I, there are so many things where it's, it wasn't just about not being able to relate. It was also very much about imposter syndrome. Mm. And in those situations, mm. I had to call on my courage so much more than my white male counterparts would have done because they already had an affinity at some level they were already a part of a group that I wasn't a part of. So I would have to go into a robing room, for example, where we put on our wig and gown and know that in that room, I'll be putting on my wig and gown as the only person in the room amidst 50, 60 men. I'd have to go into the courtroom. So I was calling, I called on my courage and I habituated myself around being able to draw on my courage throughout my entire career. So what I, what I say is that as women, what we, what we have um, is uh, an experience in, uh, to some degree, as long as you've stretched yourself outside of your comfort zone in your career and everyone around this room and know that everyone who's watching will have had to have done, we would have habituated ourselves around calling deep on our courage. And we can bring that, that ability to stand up, to speak truth, mm -hmm. to to step in where in fact it would have been fearful to do so a fear that other people would not have experienced because it was just commonplace for them and just drawing on that draw calling to memory where we've stepped in and we have that to lean on to move move us forward yeah that recalling is so powerful isn't it yeah well as you're speaking and you know about stepping up and stepping in and putting your head up and you know taking all these stands i'm one the, the word confidence is coming to mind and is, so is there a difference between confidence and courage are they the same thing or what what what's the difference yeah so i i believe that confidence is a belief a belief in your abilities so you will say, I'm confident, I believe uh, that I can do this. I believe that I can do this. And I often think about uh, Sound of Music and where uh, we, we've got uh, Julie Andrews, who's about to head into this whole new career. And she's singing as she goes, and she says, I have confidence in me. And she's talking about this uh, belief that she has in her abilities. And it's, it's a positive affirmation about what you see will come based on the abilities that you believe that you have, you step into that. Whereas courage, courage is about character. Courage is about saying you are going to move. It's very much about action. I believe it's intrinsically connected with action in the face of not knowing if you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm yeah so even, even if yeah you do it because it's the right thing because it's the right thing to do 
So in the moment, if courage is drawn on in the moment, right? But is there anything that we can do before the moment to begin to cultivate courage and to, can you cultivate courage um, outside of that moment? And what do you, how, how do you? So I, I believe that we can cultivate courage for sure. And courage for me is very much based on values. So mm -hmm. what what are those what are those fundamental things in my life that are non-negotiable? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when mm -hmm. I'm in tune with those, then I I so for example I know that justice is a key pillar for me. That that's that's a part of my value system, and hence the career choice that I made. Well, what that means is where I see an injustice. Because I have, I'm in tune, I'm connected with my values, my value system. There'll be something that's triggered within me when it represents an injustice that I will have to speak out because that's who I am. That's a part of my core identity. So I, I, in answer to your question, Dion, I, I firmly believe that we can, we can cultivate that getting connected with what's important to us in society. What are the issues that are irksome? for us what are the things that are wrong to us and when we're connected to that then each day taking an act of courage and stretching and saying i'm going to speak out about that um, even in the small things i think it starts actually with the small things mm -hmm. it might start with in our families where in fact we hear something that is is wrong and it flies in the face of what we believe to be true about society, about other people, in the small things, we can start to cultivate our courage. We can start to hear ourselves renounce that, renounce that opinion. We can, we can start to practice our response to that. That's how we start to cultivate courage, the ability to speak up, speak truth to, a, to small power. And then that cultivates our ability to speak truth to larger, uh, forms of power well, and i think about that that from a, the sense of purpose because to mm -hmm. me that speaks deeply to um the more you can connect to your sense of purpose the more yes. courageous you can be but yes. i mean the other piece of that is that it it really does connect back to your physical and mental health when you start to make those connections just how you feel in the world how you show up in the world mm -hmm. And yeah. I think sometimes when we talk about these things, we talk about them in buckets instead of, you know, kind of looking at the holistic way yeah. that our actions in the world and our connection to how we feel. And boy, the world needs, we need more courageous leaders. Mm -hmm. And so, no, our, and so where, what do you think? I mean, because again, there's, we're, I think we're really at an inflection point with all the, all this change going on. I'm curious as to why you think we kind of have this pulling apart of like two different kinds of leaders and what I would say cowardice and fear on one side and, and courage and vision on the other. And what happens to, what have you seen that's kind of make, made people flip one way or the other? Well, the thing about crises is crises, I believe, is, uh, serves a revelatory purpose crises demonstrates reveals what's already in a person mm. so we are what's manifesting in leadership is what was already extant mm. it was there it's just mm. revealing what what was already in existence so it's not a and so to Dion's point then can it be cultivated it was already there it was being it was being cultivated in secret right and what crisis does is it just exposes it it brings light to it um so for example uh when we uh, what we know for example is that covid has disproportionately affected members from the um bame community black asian and minority ethnic community and that's clearly not just in the uk that's around the world right. but if i just look at the uk where we're based it but but it's not that covid um has disproportionately affected just in isolation it's just exposed the inequalities that already existed right. that's what it's done it's highlighted them it's exacerbated them yeah. they were pre-existing 
So what we're seeing in relation to lead leadership and the, the poor responses compared with those which are much more apt and able and fitting is that those leaders who have primed themselves with qualities that were about servant-hearted leadership, that mm -hmm. were about focusing on the people mm -hmm. and how we can make the, 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 uh, our society and our circle of influence, whatever that might be, how we can make it better for them as opposed to my pure self-interest, yeah. as opposed to, for example, um, serving the agenda of my next election. As opposed to, what are we talking about? As, you know, and I would add one other thing to that is, yeah. is just because the other thing, and especially because we're a women's group, is to say there is, I've seen multiple studies now that show COVID is impacting, not from a health perspective necessarily, but from a gender equity perspective. More women yes. are in their jobs, more women, Absolutely. women, women of color, and you look at, yes. people and, and so um, it, it's, to me, it's a call to action around saying, we have to lift this up and say, all these steps we've made forward for gender equity, yeah. for all of us, um, I hope we don't go backwards. And I think that there needs to be some courage around talking about how we solve for this. Mm -hmm. I love what you say about it, about establishing what's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. and, and that, for me, is really key in this whole discussion. Yes. Right. Because I don't know if we've made inequality non-negotiable, equality non a non-negotiable. Yeah. It and should that, be. Yeah. yeah. You know, because yes. then I think it's not about whether we, because I say all the time, I've just written the book and I've just been saying how we can do anything we want. You know, when we put our minds to things, we're powerful. We can do what we want. It's just about the questioning of whether we take those courageous, if we feel motivated to take those courageous steps. And the point you raise about making things non-negotiable for me is again, changing point yeah. that we need to make equity non-negotiable yeah non -negotiable. yeah yeah absolutely Dion. i agree with that yeah and i think very very powerful there um Dion was saying we have to continue to put our minds together so that is working together all the time through whatever is in our way you know we have to have that courage together and and yes. we're, we are stronger as a collective i agree with you 100 percent. this yeah. this power of and that's courage it's yep. courage to stand together <laughs> we've seen it i mean again we talked before we came on a little bit about you know john lewis and i just um mm -hmm. you know i know he's in the united states but i think many people around the world know i mean as a young man 15 he said, you know, at, and at 17, he had met Rosa Parks. And by 18, he had had a conversation with Martin Luther King Jr. And, you know, amazing, right, to be influenced. But amazing. You know, yeah. just to see the pictures of, of what it takes to make real change. And I think that's where the courage yeah. steps in. Are we courageous enough to go across whatever bridge it is we have to cross? Oh, yeah. No, there may not be good things on the other side, but because it's the right thing. And I think that's, um, it goes back to that, that sense of purpose and how resilient we are to get up and how much we connect to pick each other up. Yeah, you know, yeah. to get across. You know what, you know, I've got goosebumps listening. I know what it takes to to do the right thing, and that's what we're really talking about here. That we have an opportunity in the aftermath of COVID nineteen to do the right thing, and it's going to take some courage. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's going to take courage. Yeah, you know what? We we've run right out of time, and it's been. <sighs> I've had goosebumps several times through your pres through your, through through your presentation, yeah. and and um, we could go on talking about this forever, but we're out of time. Do, any final word before with thirty seconds? Yeah, I would I would encourage each of us to to link to purpose, as Mims was saying. Victor Frankl said, "When we know our why, we can endure almost anyhow, mm -hmm. anyhow." And uh, I know for sure that we are courageous by our very nature. We are courageous people, we are courageous women, and every single one of us can play a part in making a difference and ensuring that we build back better for all post-COVID. Oh, well said, amazing. I had goosebumps once again. <laughs> um, and, and the biggest thing is, is I'm gonna invite everyone to continue to work together because we can yes. do so 
many, many good things. So on that note, thank you so much, Sharon, for sh sharing all your insights and your beautiful words about being courageous in leadership. Can I ask you to raise your glass? Here's to good health and a more sustainable and inclusive future. Yeah, amen. Cheers. Please join us again next week. We are going to have Wincy Knight on and we are going to be talking about diversity and inclusion and what that looks like in media. So another fantastic conversation. So once again, please join us. If you haven't done already, please go to uh, gw4w.org um, to download the white paper if you need any support or you have any feedback whatsoever, please let us know as well. And you can do that on gw4w.org or on Facebook page. But please, please join us again. So always remember, great, great minds, minds sip, sip together. 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 <laughs> See you next week. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay.